the thing about Sudbury Valley School is that it was designed specifically to be an environment where children prepare themselves to function effectively in the 21st century. And that was done even in the 60s, because in the 60s, we knew what was coming down the pike. That was the beginning of the computer age. And all of the features that that exemplify the computer age were in evidence at the time. They just became more evident and more rich in, in content as time went on. And uh, I'd like to describe what the essential feature of Sudbury Valley is that fulfills that goal. Well, I am interested in that, but I'd also like, if, as long as you're describing, for you to talk about why, not so much why you could tell that it was going to be a very different age in the 90s and in the next century, but why the kind of school that was being envisioned would be good, whether it was or not. Well, here's the thing. What's a school for? That's the real question. Why, why do you need a school? What's its function? And there, there weren't schools throughout history. So the question is, why do they suddenly appear? Why do you need them? And what do they do for anybody? And the thing is that what what you need a school for in the modern modern current era is to have a safe place for children to develop. Because before the 19th century, before the 18th century, for sure, before the industrial age, people just grew up. They grew up in the communities. And this is key here to what the conception of Sudbury Valley is. People grew up embedded in their communities. And they didn't need a special place to prepare to be embedded in their communities. I mean, an adult is, is, a, is a human being who's been born, goes through a certain number of years, and then lives in the community either in which he was born or to which he was transported. But they didn't need any special preparation because evolution did the special preparation. Evolution prepares you to every animal, to live in the environment into which they've evolved. And human beings have been designed to evolve into human communities. And that's what they did throughout hundreds of thousands of years. And what happened, you know, historically in the industrial age is that it didn't become safe. And you had needs that were anti-evolutionary. Machines aren't evolutionary in and of themselves because they require people to, to, to work them, especially in the early industrial age where they didn't have good feedback, and so people had to be essentially part of the machine. So now we have this wonderful thing, and that was evident back in the 60s already. We have a situation where we can now function growing up as we were evolved to grow up, to be embedded in the essence of the community around us and do it in a safe environment that doesn't expose children to dangers. And I, I'd like to explain that in greater detail, but I'm not sure I'm making myself clear. Well, uh, you are making yourself clear, but I'd like a lot more information about how a community, per se, where children can grow up independently, cannot expose them to greater dangers than just plain life when they're being watched 24 hours a day. I'm not sure I get the problem. If you if you take children basically off the street and protect them from the mobile dangers of, 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 of the world outside, at least until they're competent enough to maneuver them, until they're welcome into the outside community, then you're providing that kind of an environment. But this is what I want to emphasize. Why is Sudbury Valley the perfect embedding in the 21st century? when it looks like we're the opposite. We don't have classes, we don't teach, we don't do any of the things that schools do, but that were never done throughout history, historically, evolutionarily, they were never done. So what's going on here in Sudbury Valley? And there are two things going on. There's preparation for an individual human being to fulfill their full natural (laughs) evolutionary destiny. And there's the preparation for children to function in American society. And those two things are conjoined in Sudbury Valley and only in Sudbury Valley. And I want to talk about each one. Let's talk about the individual thing. People 
when when people were born into the world before the industrial era, they they were take an infant. They're born into the world, and the world is a mass of inputs that is completely puzzling to a newborn child. I don't care whether you're born in the middle of a jungle or whether you're born in the middle of a city or anything before before you had factories. They were born in, or on a farm or whatever. Well, even if the, you had factories when they were born, they were born in that, at, to this, uh, right, into this amazingly different world. Uh, yeah, they come out of the womb and they're assaulted by untold billions, trillions, gazillions of inputs that have no structure whatsoever. And they have been given, endowed by nature with minds that are able somehow miraculously, and we don't have a clue how this is done, to sift and organize and make some patterns out of these inputs that each individual human being, every human being, no matter where born or who they are, each individual human being has the ability to do that from birth. In fact, they need it from birth. If they couldn't do it from birth, if you had to literally put a, ch- a newborn infant through its paces by maneuvering their hands and their mouths and everything because they were not capable of handling the environment, then the species would never have survived. It's built in, nature has built that in, to be able to maneuver a world which for them is rapidly changing. I mean, every minute is change for a newborn child. And for toddlers, every every minute of their lives is a new experience. And one of, I always say that one of the most exciting parts of, of watching a child develop is what people amusingly call the terrible twos. Because when kids reach the age of around two and they're really mobile and they're beginning to be verbal, so they're beginning to be able to communicate with other people, my God, they're attacking the world with such zest that it drives a lot of adults around them crazy. They say they're tearing everything apart. Well, they are. They're trying to figure out everything they can approach, touch, handle, hear, smell, taste. They're trying to grab it all and create for themselves a model of this reality that they can maneuver. And they can do it. And imagine they can do it when they're toddlers. That's what we're designed to do. And we've never lost that ability. So the keep that in mind because the key feature of the 21st century that everybody talks about, but they talk about it with fear for no reason. The key feature of the 21st century is it's rapidly changing. I mean, the pace of change of our lives is almost unbelievable. I, I, I couldn't even believe it when I realized that we had the first exchanges with the internet as a school in 1993, when we hired somebody to put put our school on chat rooms or 1993 was it really that bulletin light? boards? It was, and I mean 1993. It's not that many years ago. There was nothing, no way to communicate across what eventually became the internet. This is all recent, and it's plunging forward. Everything is plunging forward. 3D printing, uh, virtual reality. I mean. Every day something new is coming. And this is what's so interesting. The, the, the young generation isn't afraid of that at all. It's the older people who are terrified of it. Kids, you give them a phone, you give them an iPad, you give them a, a, a laptop, you give them a desktop, whatever. They'll find out everything about it. And, and what's fascinating is this was shown by Sugata Mitra around in the, in the late 90s in an experiment he ran in India, of all places. We're not talking about a, quote, developed country. Uh, it, 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 he, he, he did this famous... I'm not sure Indians would feel the same way Well, about not it. where he they were was. They certainly he was, developed intellectually. He was in a sl- his, his institute was in a slum in, yeah. in, in India, and they had a scientific institute there, and he ran this experiment. He said, let's see what happens. All the kids were running around the street. None of them were in school. None of them were literate. None of them could read. And he did his famous hole-in-the-wall experiment. And the the hole-in-the-wall experiment was he made literally a hole in the wall that surrounded his institute and put a computer screen in it, a touch screen in that. And he he turned the computer, I don't even know if he turned it on. And he just said, let's see what happens because the kids are all running around and they're examining things on the street and 
a bunch of them noticed this thing in the wall that was that was a computer screen and they started playing with it and in and what he found and he documented it he documented he had cameras he documented he made documentaries he wrote articles he became world famous rightly so because what he discovered was that these kids through their insatiable exploration had figured out how to make this thing this computer which they didn't have a name for at the time do all kinds of things that excited them and interested them and in his article he says they discovered things about windows the windows of the time that we didn't know about because they were they were not afraid of it they weren't afraid of anything new they weren't afraid of change they weren't afraid to explore they weren't afraid to meet things that they didn't know because they were thirsting for making sense out of their environment and that's what kids are now now we see we're, we've entered an era which is like the evolutionary era. It's perfect. It's what the human species was made for. An era in which everything is changing, everything's open to question. The, the, the way to make it in this modern world is to be open to that and never, never to be directed or squelched or squished or put into any pre-cut pattern. And uh, it was very interesting. Last night I had, I mean, and this, this hits everything. Last night I had a conversation, a phone conversation with a friend of mine who's a very successful child psychologist and runs a clinic for children and a, apparently a clinic that is very, very well known and very well thought of. And uh, he had visited the school and he spent some time here. And he had one question that was sort of bothering me. That's a perfect question coming from a clinician. He, he said, I'm just a little concerned that there weren't, I didn't see a lot of creative manipulative materials in the school. Like, for example, in the playroom. I mean, yes, there were, this is him talking. There were blocks in the playroom and so forth. But in, in, in my clinic, we have all kinds of things that are, that are designed to be able to be manipulated by children. And the children in the clinic come and they use them in imaginative ways. And I didn't see the kids in the school doing that in the playroom. And I had a good laugh and I said to him, that's because you didn't walk around the school. <laughs> you didn't walk on the campus. I mean, the kids manipulate everything in creative ways. For them, even even the blocks that were in the playroom were too, were too dull. They take everything a minute. I said, oh, that's an interesting perspective, he said. I hadn't thought of that. And he actually realized that he was, he was dealing with people who perhaps, I don't know his practice, needed help to make order of the world because that's why they were in his psychological clean, clinic. But when he thought about it, he said, well, that, that, makes, that actually makes sense. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it that way. The kids here don't need to be given creative materials because every material around them is a is a is a piece of raw is material asking, for yeah asking for manipulation for manipulation and creativity. So the atmosphere in the school that's point one. The atmosphere in the school is perfectly designed to en enable a child seamlessly and 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 according to the to the the dictates of nature to move into the full 21st century world it's designed for that because it doesn't squelch that desire to learn to be curious to make order out of whatever it is that moves them and in fact they move seamlessly as we saw from the alumni that we talk to we see that all the time they move seamlessly into that world and the younger they are now the more quickly they move into a rapidly changing world, which is totally dominated by IT. Whether they're IT specialists or not, our world is all a world of IT. I don't care what you're doing. Uh, there was some person who was invent creating some artwork and something. What does that person do? They find a way to market it online. They find platforms mm -hmm. to put it on. I mean, this is the new world. And that world is a complete, completely blocked out in traditional schools. And it... it it puzzles me no end that anybody could even think that what's called a school in the traditional view has anything to do with preparing children for adulthood. It's the opposite of it. 
it squelches their creativity. It doesn't let them talk. It doesn't let them move. It doesn't let them do what they want with their time. It forces them to do things that are repugnant to them. And even the things that aren't repugnant to them, it forces them to do in a way that the teacher or the curriculum or the administrator controls, which has no relationship to what reality is nowadays, which is don't control. And all the major modern companies that are making a mark in the world know that and are looking for this kind of thing. That's point one about Sudbury Valley. The second point is no less important than the first point. And that is you want to embed children in an environment that is compatible socially and politically in a deeper political sense with the, the, the community outside. And America has a unique environment and it's an environment which is defined by our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution. We've written a great deal about that in our literature to, to try to bring that to the fore. And the American environment is one in which people are basically free. They have freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of belief. But they also are governed, self-governed in a way that they make rules to protect each other's freedom. That's right in the Declaration of Independence. You know, everybody has life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, but to protect those rights, they, they create governments because in a society those rights can clash and the way you create a government in our environment whose sole purpose really is to protect those rights is to have a government by consent of the government. Now, that's what we do. That's what Sudbury Valley is. I mean, the kids grow up in that environment. There's no other school environment like a Sudbury model environment. There just isn't any. Here, children are treated like people, like they're going to be treated when they're people in the outside world. They exercise the right of having a voice in how they're governed. They have an equal voice to everybody else. There's no, there's no hierarchy. There's no advanced control board that controls everything else the community governs itself and it's been doing it for 51 years and here we are successful <laughs> functioning viable you know the, the community hires the people that serve it in traditional ways like doing the bookkeeping and so forth it, it hires those people it monitors them it has its own court system, its own judicial system to deal with infractions and all of the constitutional rights granted to adults in the outside community are granted to children. They're not treated as children, they're people. And there are wonderful quotes out of, out of some interviews that we did years ago of, of alumni about their memories of their, of, their, of their years at the school. And one of them says, oh, when, when we were eight, we never thought of ourselves as children. We, we just thought of ourselves as people like everybody else. We, we happen to be smaller, but we, were, we felt equal to everybody. And that's, of course, the point of the, of the country. And so the way you prepare people to, to join any society is to embed them. And we embed, Sudbury Valley embeds children in the same environment of freedom and collective self-government that they then are released into. Imagine what the school system does. The school system is the perfect training ground for a dictatorship. I mean, it's got a hierarchy. It's got people who make rules arbitrarily. It can punish. It, it has complete control over the people in it. How does that prepare a child to be a member of the community at large? Then at 18, you throw them out into the world. You say, okay, you're graduates. Now become good citizens. When they don't even have an idea what it means. And for our kids, it's not even a question. What do you mean? We know what it means to be a good citizen. It's the same as to be a good citizen in Sudbury Valley because what we do here is exactly what we do in the outside world. So you've got this double feature of Sudbury Valley School. It, it embeds children in the intellectual and emotional and social environment of the 21st century, and it embeds people in the socio-political environment of the country for which this school in which this school exists. And uh, there it is. Sudbury Valley School is, and the Sudbury Model Schools are the only things that really make sense at this point. And uh, I don't know, the, the proof of the pudding is that people are opening them all over. And I think eventually people will understand that the traditional system is rotten to the core, basically.